Today I'm going to talk a little bit about a disease that's been gradually killing about a fifth of my tomatoes this season, Fusarium wilt. I'm going to go over what it's caused by, common symptoms in tomatoes, why it's a particularly insidious disease, and, and what can be done to control it in a home garden. Now, fair warning, this video is going to be a bit too talking head, so to speak. So if watching some fat guy talk about garden fungus for the next however many minutes or so isn't your thing, I completely understand if you want to bow out. There honestly just isn't a lot of visually appealing B-roll for this particular topic. So anyway, Fusarium wilt is caused by a soil-borne fungal pathogen known as Fusarium oxysporum which infects the vascular tissue of plants, causing a sort of slow creeping death that starts with wilting, as the name implies, progresses to the yellowing of leaves, and ultimately the death of the entire plant. Uh, fungal spores typically enter a plant by way of the roots and then begin to colonize the vascular tissue within the stem. Uh, this infection of the vascular tissues interferes with the plant's ability to distribute water and nutrients throughout itself, leading to that telltale wilt. Now, in the early stages of the disease, plants might recover from their initial wilting, but they will likely be stunted in terms of growth and fruit production. And make no mistake, this disease is an eventual death sentence. Uh, now, interestingly, there seems to be a strain of Fusarium specifically adapted to almost every plant us gardeners want to grow, and a strain adapted to, say, beets uh, might not affect, say, squash. Uh, and this could explain why tomatoes in two of my beds are dying, but the cucumbers I have going in the exact same beds have thrived. Now, I've pinned some links uh, in the comments to some state extension service websites that go into way more detail on fusarium wilt than the quick overview I just laid out. Uh, now, state extension services are wonderful resources and are definitely worth tapping if you suspect a pathogen might be at work in your garden. All right, now let's take a quick look at the telltale symptoms of fusarium wilt in tomatoes. All right, one of the earliest signs and symptoms of fusarium wilt is stunted plants and fruit. Uh, these super sue tomatoes we're looking at here, these really should have grown to a height of five to maybe six feet. They're classified as a, an indeterminate to <clears throat> a semi determinate tomato. But as you can see, these have topped out at maybe three feet. And on top of that, these fruits are tiny. Um, this variety of tomato is supposed to produce fruits um, in the uh, four to six ounce, ounce range. And these are like cherry tomatoes, basically, maybe a little bigger. Um, they're still safe to eat. Uh, my research indicates that the fruits that you do get from Fusarium wilt infected tomatoes um, aren't hazardous to humans, um, but really weak and inadequate fruit. Um, another sign that you might see is the plant wilting in the afternoon sun, um, even though they're, say, uh, well watered and um, under, under shade cloth. Um, but those symptoms, you know, wilting and stunting can be due to uh, a number of different things. Um, but as the disease progresses, uh, we're going to see um, more telltale signs. All right, so I'm going to zoom in on this tomato plant that's sort of at the back of this bed here, and this is still super sue. Um, the variety seems to be really uh, quite affected by fusarium wilt, but as the disease progresses, what you're going to see is uh, here, you'll notice that this one side of the plant that I'm pointing at here is healthy, um, you know, still doing okay. However, this side here, um, the, the leaves are starting to yellow starting at the bottom, working their way up to the top. And this one side showing first is looking not so great. That is a very telltale sign of fusarium wilt, as opposed to other wilt diseases, uh, such as uh, verticillium wilt or bacterial wilt, um, affecting one side with leaf necrosis starting at the bottom, working its way up. Um, and um, I'll point out that there is no way to 150% tell a given disease is affecting your plants without a lab test, which um, I would wager most uh, gardeners, home gardeners, are not going to pay for. Um, but you can really narrow it down and be, I would say, 90% certain. And then we're going to take a look here at the final telltale sign of fusarium wilt. Okay, so here I've cut down one of my uh, fusarium wilt affected plants that is was a complete goner. And the final telltale sign you can see 
um, on the inside of the stem, when you cut it, there's kind of a brown ring, um, not quite center, not quite right at the edge. As the fungus infects the, uh, the vascular tissue, uh, moving up the plant like this, it causes a necrosis and it starts to turn brown. This right here is the final clincher in diagnosing this plant as uh, being affected with fusarium wilt. Um, so even though I can't be 100 million percent certain without sending this off to a lab and paying God only knows what fees, I'm very confident at this point in calling it that, yep, my garden beds are infected with fusarium wilt. As I noted earlier, fusarium wilt is a particularly insidious plant disease. The fungus that causes it is soil-borne, and it can persist in soil for up to a decade. And, unlike many other fungal diseases, fusarium works from the inside out, entering through the roots and infesting the very core of the plant. This means it can't really be controlled with uh, careful pruning or topical fungicides, uh, which can sometimes work to slow down such diseases as blight. Fusarium wilt will actually have you wishing you just had blight. And adding insult to injury, uh, fusarium is highly contagious. It can easily spread via garden tools and foot traffic. Also, in later stages of the disease, uh, the fungus will reach uh, the outer surface of the plants, and then it can shed spores, which can potentially spread uh, by wind. So, fun stuff. Now, even though I'm only seeing symptoms of wilt in two of my beds, it's a pretty safe bet that most, if not all, of my small backyard garden space is also infected. Now, as much as this all really sucks, all is not lost. Luckily, there are a fairly large number of tomato varieties that are resistant to fusarium wilt. Uh, for example, Cherokee Purple, uh, my favorite slicing tomato, uh, is one example of a highly disease-resistant variety. Uh, You'll notice that even though these plants are almost touching my infected Super Sue tomatoes, they're showing no signs of illness. Uh, not only is Cherokee Purple known to be resistant to all three uh, known races of tomato fusarium wilt, uh, they're also resistant to bacterial spec, verticillium wilt, and, and a few others. And that's really pretty impressive for uh, an heirloom variety. In addition to growing resistant tomato varieties and maybe rotating tomatoes out of the most affected beds for a few seasons, there are some measures that can allegedly reduce the number of viable fungal spores in the soil itself. Uh, for instance, I've seen uh, solar solarization suggested as a potential countermeasure. This would involve laying plastic sheeting over the beds to intensify solar heating, hopefully to the point of killing the, uh, the, the spores. Uh, but my concern with this method is I imagine it would only be effective for the uppermost layer of soil. Uh, instead, the method I am going to try over the fall and winter is called biofumigation. Uh, this will involve planting a uh, cover crop of brassicas, particularly mustards, and then chopping them down and tilling them into the soil just after they flower. So it turns out that brassicas contain a high concentration of a compound called uh, glu glucosinolate, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is known to kill a number of soil pathogens and even some multicellular pests such as root knot nematode. When chopped, uh, dropped, and tilled in, the cover crop leaches this compound into the soil, hopefully killing untold numbers of uh, fungal spores in the process. From what I've been reading, Indian mustard and black mustard are the two kinds that have the highest concentrations of glucosinolate. So uh, those are what I'm going to be growing in my affected beds over the winter. I obviously don't expect biofumigation to kill every single fusarium spore in my gardens, but hopefully it reduces their numbers enough to substantially reduce the chances of my uh, crops becoming infected. So that's the quick rundown on fusarium wilt and how to control it. Uh, while this disease's appearance in my garden is a definite bummer, it has led me down a pretty fascinating rabbit hole in terms of research. It's forced me to learn about disease mitigation in the garden, and that's a pretty useful knowledge to have. So, until next time, let's hope it all doesn't die.